We're going to look at the first eight verses of Isaiah. I'm not going to teach you it. I'm going to sort of preach to you today. There's been so much on my heart. I got up this morning all ready to do Acts chapter 6. And the Lord put this burden on my heart so much for the subject that we're going to talk about. So please open your hearts and let the Lord speak to you. Isaiah chapter 6. Let's read together the first eight verses. Very familiar passage. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, or seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, the whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me. Now, I want to remind you that Isaiah is arguably one of the two most holy men in all of scriptures. And this is Isaiah on his face before the throne of God in this vision. And he's saying, woe is me. Now, we might look at Isaiah and think, well, well what, what do you have to be woeing about? You're one of the good guys. But in the presence of God, we see who we really are. And that's why he cried, woe is me. I'm ruined, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth, and he said, See, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sins atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord, and here's the voice to you, Calvary Chapel, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And Isaiah's timid response was, I'll go, send me. Father, as we talk about that very thing that you've put on my heart this morning, Lord, I'm asking that we would be those like uh, Isaiah who would deal with our own woes. And then we could say, send us. Lord, may we stand before you today ready and willing Not able, Lord, none of us are apart from you, but ready and willing to do what you've called us to do. Already this morning, Lord, I've seen the power of your hand moving, answering a prayer for more than 15 years. Today, Lord, speak to our hearts, each of us as individuals. Speak to our hearts. And then ask us, who can I send? And dear God, I pray by the power of your spirit, we would be willing if there's anyone in this service or anybody coming to the next two services, Lord, if they don't know you, if they're not yet born again, then ask them to be yours. Offer to forgive their sins. And spirit of God, move upon their hearts that their answer, their response will be yes. We love you. We praise you. And because we have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, we thank you. And we pray these things in the name of our King. His name is Jesus. Amen. Before I get started, just a quick show of hands. Anybody here yet seen the Revolution or Jesus Revolution movie? Any? We got a few in here. Uh, it's about the Jesus people movement back in the 60s and early 70s. Uh, The Calvary Chapel movement sort of gave birth to the Jesus People movement, and that movie is out now. I would encourage you to see it. It's about a revival, really more of an awakening, and I don't want to get caught up in the terminology, revival, awakening, you know what we're talking about, but a revival, the word simply means that we make something that was dead or asleep, and we make it alive again, and I believe with all of my heart in these last days, That's exactly what Jesus wants to do. I personally don't think it is a coincidence that the Jesus Revolution movie is coming out at the same time the movement of the Spirit of God is taking place in Asbury, Kentucky. 
And I hope you're as interested in that as I am. We who are Calvary Chapel pastors, because of where we came from, were really concerned and interested about what's going on there. And, oh Lord, is this an answer to our prayers? And obviously on our list server, there has been a lot of discussion about it. I want to read you just three comments that some of my friends, these are men that I know and trust, have shared with me. First one says, in the 1960s, Orange County had the largest demographic of 18 to 25-year-olds of anywhere in the country. Drugs, sex, and rock and roll were swallowing a whole generation. Then Jesus came along. And I can stop just very briefly right there. Unless you're as old as I am, you have no ability to comprehend what was going on back then. People were dropping out, completely going off the grid because it was simply nothing that this world had to offer them. In San Francisco, in the Haight-Ashbury district, there was a movement that got started and hippies from all over the world began congregating and then they began spreading out. And that was the perfect time for Jesus to begin to move. It was the perfect time. I think the time that we live in is even more perfect. Let me continue reading. He said the university in Asbury University in Kentucky is a college. There's also a seminary. The university is where faith dies and people become woke. The university teaches, trains, and indoctrinates the next generation. The university is where speech is censored and hormones are set free. Now, some of you are sending kids to college soon. I'm sorry in advance. <laughs> the university is where subjective triumphs over the objective and preference triumphs over truth. The university is where isms are swallowing a whole generation. Then Jesus came along. Listen to this. I think this is brilliant. Out of the eater came something to eat, and out of the strong, something sweet. We know that, of course, the parable, the riddle that Samson told. And then my friend says this, whatever you call it, revival, renewal, a season of refreshing, the visitation of Jesus is the visitation of Jesus. And that's what we've been watching at Asbury University. Now for 12 days, young people have been gathering together in sort of a spontaneous move of God's spirit. They were just going to a mandatory chapel service. And the spirit of God began to blow. And those kids started repenting. Those kids started worshiping. And that's what they've been doing for 12 days nonstop with no signs of slowing down. To the contrary, this move of God's Spirit is spreading to other universities, Tennessee, Ohio. I hope, I pray, I pray you'll pray, University of Texas at San Antonio. Another friend who was there during the Jesus movement, he said this, I sat in a small private meeting with Juan Carlos Ortiz, who wrote the book Disciple, a story of how God moved powerfully in Argentina. This was a man who was one of the leaders of the Great Awakening in Argentina. A story of how God moved powerfully in Argentina. His church was one of the largest in the world. He began with a statement. Now, he's talking to American pastors. Do you know what the problem with the church in America is? Coming from a man who was used during the time of revival, like Pastor Chuck, we wanted to hear his perspective. Here's what he said. You want to know what's wrong with the church in America? It's the buildings. We get these buildings and our ministry changes. Everything is about the building filling the building, paying for the building. Success is about filling the building. 
He said, when we started in Argentina, we had Bibles and guitars. We got on the train, we got off the next stop, we worshiped, and we preached the gospel, and we planted a church. We got back on the train and went to the next stop. We did that everywhere we stopped on the train. We had no buildings, and God did a mighty work. He said, we need to get rid of the buildings and get back to the ministry. He was in his 70s and still had a revolutionary spirit for the gospel. He wasn't suggesting we sell our buildings or move out of our buildings, but the point was taken. The spirit moves outside of our religious traditions. And then finally, a pastor from the East Coast, a Calvary Chapel pastor, and he said, we flew two pastors there to Asbury, one just returned, the other is still there. They will have more to say when they return. Here's what one of the pastors put on his Facebook. And here's this pastor's comment. Real revival is happening in the middle of nowhere, Kentucky. Thousands and thousands of people are flocking to Asbury University, not to hear a speaker, not to hear a celebrity, but to hear from Jesus. People have been praying for revival among this next generation for decades. And we here at Calvary Chapel, and you've heard me pray over and over, Lord, since you're coming soon, and, and please make sure you understand this, Jesus is coming soon. And these are the very kinds of signs that make that statement absolutely dependable. Jesus is coming soon. And isn't it true? We've been praying for one more move of God's Spirit we want God to get the people that we love, the people that we pray for, the people in our families. We want those people saved. We don't want them left behind. So we've been praying, okay, Lord, I know you're coming soon, but one more move of your spirit. He said, we've been praying for this generation for decades, and this might be the time for this generation to stand up and find their true identity in Jesus, learning to walk in the spirit and trust the Lord. We live in a society filled with anxiety, depression, identity crisis, a thirst to be loved, a constant desire for approval. These things are all being cured inside of Hughes Auditorium. Let me read that again. These things are all being cured inside Hughes Auditorium, and that is the main place where they're meeting in Asbury. He continues, Jesus is breaking chains. He's freeing people from bondage, healing the sick, and giving people true identity. And then he turns exhorter. He says, if you have the ability to go to Wilmore, Kentucky, just do it. Work can wait. Sports can wait. Life can be put on hold for a couple of days. This revival has been going on for a week and a half straight and has no signs of slowing down. Yesterday afternoon, people were waiting five hours in line just for the opportunity to get inside. Again, not to see a Christian artist, not to hear a famous speaker, but to hear Jesus. The revival is beginning to spread to other universities across the nation, a generation that has been so lost and looking for answers in all the wrong places finally has a chance to rise up and find out what true love is. Nothing planned, nothing staged, nothing sensationalized, nothing monetized, no celebrities, just Jesus. You know, Paul and I have been praying for the lost, the hurting, the hungry, the broken, the needy, the confused, the fearful, the angry for a very, very long time. But it's the hungry that our hearts are really for. When I say hungry, people who know they're missing the one thing that will satisfy, people that know there's more. It's not in an identity that the world has made up. You can be whoever or whatever you want, but, but it's in a true hunger for Jesus Christ. That's what happened in the hippie days in the Jesus people movement of the late 60s and 70s. Just a bunch of people that had given up on life. They'd seen the hypocrisy of their parents and their grandparents' generations. They just didn't want any more of it in the 
convenient escape was drugs. LSD was the thing to do because it took you out of an awareness of reality and put you in a place where you could sort of do whatever you wanted to do and make up your own reality. And yet when God's spirit began to move, those hippies found that Jesus was there and his arms were open and he loved them. And he asked them to come to him and they really came to him in droves. By the thousands, it was a move of God's spirit that changed the world. But that doesn't do any good for us. It doesn't have real value for us because that was more than 50 years ago. And I don't know about you, but the older I get, the more urgent I become for that move of God's spirit to happen right here in Universal City, Texas, in San Antonio, the people that we love, the people that we care about, the people that are hurting, the people that are in pain, your young children who are being indoctrinated and brainwashed. Not waiting to university for it to happen, but starting at very young ages. We want those men, those women, those boys, those girls to get saved. So how do we do it? It's simple. Judgment begins at the house of God. That's why I like to refer to what's happening in Asbury and what I hope and pray is going to happen right here in Texas. I like to refer to it as a revival rather than an awakening. An awakening is when people get saved. And we're going to see, I think, droves of people get saved just like happened in the late 60s and early 70s. But before that can happen, in these last days, we've got to be Isaiah. We've got to get to the point where we say, woe is me, where we're no longer content. Not for one moment, where we're no longer content for things to be just okay. Or to continue doing church like that's some sort of sacrificial service for the Lord. Judgment begins at the house of God. When that chapel service started, at the end of the chapel, there was a short message, as there always is at those chapel services. And the young man who was delivering the message simply said, in order for God to use you, we need to repent, we need to get right with God. And he didn't ask, he didn't give an invitation, he didn't do anything else. He just watched people starting to come forward and they were falling on their faces and repenting before God. Spontaneous worship broke out. And as I said a little while ago, it's now going on its 12th day straight and more and more people are coming. <laughs> I think one of the problems that we have with the idea or the concept of revival is that we think we can make something happen. Now, make no mistake, there are going to be Christians, professing Christians, go try to ruin what God is doing in Asbury and other places. They're going to try to figure out a way to market it, and they're going to figure out a way to get people on board, and especially they're going to try to figure out a way to come front and center so they can get the attention from it. We're going to see celebrity pastors. We're going to see worship bands show up and want a platform. But revival isn't something that we can make happen. Revival's not something we can do. This isn't one of those things where you say, okay, God, I'm willing, but you got to just pour out your spirit on me. It can't be that. It's got to be your decision to want to be right with God. A revival is involuntary. A revival doesn't happen because pastor preaches a great message. Revival happens because you become aware as holy, godly Isaiah became aware, woe is me, for I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips and I've seen the Lord and what he was saying was now I'm going to die. And yet there was one of the seraphs with the coal and a tong, and he touched his lips with it. It's the equivalent picture to you and I being covered by the blood of Jesus. So don't think revival is something that can happen. We can't plan it, nor can we organize it. 
But revival simply is your response and my response to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And when that happens, there will be, as there was in Asbury, repentance. There will be spontaneous worship. There will be no band, no celebrity preachers. There won't be anybody to share your testimony. It will be just you and the Lord. And that's the one thing I think God is asking the church, his bride, to understand that this is our responsibility. He's given everything to us. He's given us his spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing our inheritance. And the question is, what are we doing with that spirit? Are we listening to conviction? Or instead, are we just sort of, well, you know, I I know, but it's not that big a deal. It's a big deal if you want to be used by God. If you want to get right with God, you have to repent. A revival is experiencing God's presence. Nothing more. It's not for miracles. It's not for show. It's just honest fire from God. I've listened to some of the young people, the college students. They're the ones I'm most interested in. I've been listening to them share what's going on. And it's hard for them to describe. Well, I really don't know what to say or how to use words, but when I went in, some of them would say, I I just was going to go find out, take an hour during lunch and see what was going on. But when I got there, there was just a gentleness. There was a sweetness, a kindness, they would say. And when you sat down in those seats and you began to pray, you just didn't want to leave. It was like nothing else mattered. Your schedule didn't matter. Your classes didn't matter. Nothing else mattered. I just didn't want to leave because it was so sweet to experience the presence of God in a way that I've never experienced him before. And so desperately are we in need of experiencing God in that way. Because God is answering our prayers, those prayers for a long, long time. Prayers about, God, one more move of your spirit. With all of my heart, I believe that's what he's doing in Asbury and in the other places that it's spreading. I believe with all of my heart it is going to lead to thousands upon thousands of people being saved in these last days. But before we can take the message outside the church, the church first has to embrace God's holiness. We first have to be willing to say, okay, Lord, I'm willing to sacrifice. I'm willing to pay the price. Because what I want is more of you. I don't want a better life. I don't want more money. I don't want more success. What I want is not for my kids to get into a college that's going to ensure their future. What I want, Jesus, is you. And you see, that's the heart that God is going to revive. We're in the last days. I want, you want people to get saved. But the revival has to begin right here inside the church of Jesus Christ. We're the ones who are dirty. When Jesus came to Peter in the upper room after having washed 11 pairs of dirty feet, Peter looked at Jesus. He said, oh, no, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus was very honest with him. He said, well, if I don't wash your feet, then... I have nothing to do with you, nor do you have anything to do with me. And, of course, Peter, overreacting, said, Well, then wash all of me, Lord. And, and here's what Jesus said to him. He said, No, no, it's just your feet that need to be washing. You know, our feet, even as Christians, get dirty walking through this world. We get conflicted. We pick up all of the dirt from this world. And Jesus said, Let me wash your feet. That's what a revival inside the church is all about. It's about getting clean. It's about saying to God, I'm not okay. There is an emptiness, there is a longing in my heart that only you can fill.
that longing in your heart is what Jesus brought you here today to light a fire. He wants you to want more of him. He wants you to love him more, but in order to do that, you've got to receive more of his love. You've got to understand just how much he loves you. He loves you so much that he thinks about you all day, every day. How thoughts about you are precious to him. Not a fleeting thought. The psalmist says how vast is the sum of them. And you see, when I said earlier that revival isn't something that we can do, it, we can't facilitate it, we can just let it happen to us. It's because we can't even love him unless we understand just how much he loves us. So what are you willing to have turned upside down, I like to say right side up in your life? in order to have that experience with God. And I'm not talking about an afternoon. I'm talking about an experience that changes you forever. An experience where you so bask in the presence of God that that's the only thing that satisfies. It requires a heavenly perspective rather than a worldly perspective. It requires a sense of, Lord, I'm not okay, but I want to be. We need to acknowledge that he has provided the power for each and every one of us to want that. I actually saw a video of Asbury last week, um, uh, live stream, it was being live streamed, there was a guy outside, and he said, just want to show you what's happening here, and outside in the freezing rain, in the freezing rain, the, the indoor stadium was packed, 1,500 people. They had two overflow areas that were absolutely standing room only, completely, completely packed. And he took his camera and walked alongside. He said, this is the line of people waiting to get in. In the freezing rain, that line went on four, five deep, wide across the sidewalk for more than a mile. And people were waiting out in the freezing rain just to get in. Just to get in. Not to get healed, not to see a miracle, but just to get in the building. Because this was an opportunity to experience God in a way that they'd never experienced Him before. Calvary Chapel, God is moving. What are we willing to do? What are we willing to sacrifice just to be touched by God? Imagine walking in a building that's described as kind and sweet and gentle. There's just a, a spirit where His love is palpable. Wouldn't you love to be able to take your anxieties, your worries, the things that you're afraid of and walk into a place and all of those burdens and all of those cares, all of those anxieties would be removed from you. Just taken, laid down at the feet of Jesus. Now here's the best thing, we don't have to go to Kentucky. Right here, right now, we can say, Jesus, I want more of you. Or maybe we can even be more honest than that, like Isaiah was, and say, Lord, I need more of you. I'm no longer content to play the happy Christian. I'm no longer content, especially in view of being in the last days, the last hours of the last days. I'm no longer content to put on my churchy face and somebody says, how are you doing? Praise the Lord. Better than I deserve. Blessed and highly favored. How about we say, I'm okay because I've got Jesus, but I want more. 
I want more of Jesus. Are you willing to let God change your perspective on the things of this world, the things that you hold near and dear to your heart? Are you willing to rearrange your priorities? How you spend your time, the things that matter to you, the things that you're pursuing, the energy that you're spending on all of those things. Are you willing to let God do something radical in you? Because I'm here to tell you this morning that he wants to do that radical thing in you. And all he's asking for is people who are willing to say, Jesus, thy will, not my will, be done. We don't have to go to Kentucky. God will come right here to San Antonio. Like Isaiah, all we have to do is get to the place where we want more. I'll close this morning with this. Isaiah was coming off of a time of unparalleled peace and prosperity in Israel. King Uzziah, who reigned for more than 50 years in a time of peace, nobody dared come against him because he was so wealthy. He could simply crush them with his forces or he could buy their peace. It didn't matter. Israel was wealthy, prosperous. And when he died, things looked hopeless. And God said, Isaiah, you of all people shouldn't be worried about Uzziah. He was my servant. I was pleased with Isaiah. Isaiah would wonder, what are we going to do now? And he was just reflecting the people. Well, similarly, we're preoccupied with all kinds of things. I know a lot of you listen to the radio program. You know how many people call in and want me to get far right wing and give them the hope that politics is going to change this world or that a particular candidate is going to change this world and everything is going to be better. I've had people say, you're so negative, Pastor Ron. I mean, should you give us hope that the world is going to be a better place and that we can actually fix some things and shouldn't we be actively engaged in supporting the candidates that are going to do those things? And my response is always the same thing. You're not looking high enough. When there was a candidate to your liking in office or in the many offices, you still were over with anxiety, worries, and fear. You still had that gnawing inside that said, I know there's more than this to life. There's got to be more than this. You still had a broken heart, fractured relationships, many of you marriages that were broken. And somehow we get to the place, we humans, we're so adaptable. We get to the place where we can just sort of set all those things aside and pretend to be okay with everything. We need to get to the place where we can say, woe is me. For I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips and I have seen the Lord. That's what revival is about as it relates to being inside the church. We know God. We're loved by God. We even love God at least as much as we're able to express. But the reality, the reality is, is that we keep Jesus at an arm's length because he makes us uncomfortable. When he starts talking to us about holiness or when he puts his finger on your particular sin that you've rationalized as, okay, God understands, he's working on me about it. When he puts his finger on that sin, we get really uncomfortable and it's easier just to sort of back up 
and, and find sort of a space that allows us to be comfortable instead of convicted. Well, we're now living in a time where we can't afford comfort. We're living in a time when the world is looking at us We're living in a time where I want to be able to look at the faces of your kids and see Jesus all over them. I was so blessed when the ladies were doing the skit with the young ladies who were involved in the skit. Ladies, the rest of you, you're getting ready for your retreat. Are you willing to let Jesus change everything in your life? Or are you holding on to things of this world so tightly that Jesus, though he tries, he can't pry your fingers apart? And what Jesus is asking you to do is let him fill your hands and your heart with just him. Do you have enough faith to believe after all he's done for you? Do you have enough faith to believe that if you leave room only for Jesus in your life, Nothing else, no one else, only Jesus. Do you have enough faith to believe that he will fill your life so full, so satisfyingly full of all of the other things? If I recall, Jesus actually said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all the other things will be added to you. Are you afraid of losing some of the other things at the expense of completely selling out to Jesus? If that's true, then you need to ask God to increase your faith. Because he really will add all those other things. Final statement is this, moms and dads especially. Do your kids, those that will be going to university, those kids that are completely engrossed with social media now and are being brainwashed by it, do your kids see in you a mom and a dad so committed to Jesus Christ, so full of joy, so filled with peace that they'll have the right frame of reference when their hearts become troubled by all of the things in this world? I think God's asking all of us here at Calvary Chapel for a pretty radical commitment. Now, I could ruin this whole moment by giving you an invitation, having people flood to the front. I'm not going to do that today. In a moment, I'm going to be giving an invitation for people to get saved. But church, for you, are you willing to say, Jesus, all I want, all I need all I'm desperate for is you. And just like we experienced in our skit a few moments ago, if you listen real closely, you'll hear the sound of the wind, the power of the Holy Spirit coming for us. I want to be able to be used by God to answer my prayers For your kids, my kids, for this next generation. I want them to get saved. I want us to be the ones God can use to facilitate them being saved. Father, as we close today, I just thank you, Lord, 